Robin Williams is a man that is loved by many. Known for his comedic genius and his passionate acting, he's someone that fully embodied every character he played. Robin seemed to take new life lessons from every movie he worked on. In many interviews, he speaks of the experiences he had working on the 1989 film Dead Poets Society with director Peter Weir. He states that Peter is more than just a director, he's also a teacher. There's been no movie that I've walked away from, even the ones that didn't do well where you don't go, I learned a lot. You know, you, what, you, what about Dead Poets Society with, oh uh, my with, God. with Peter Weir? One of the greatest experiences. It was incredible. It was the true learning experience because Peter's more than a director, he's a teacher. I don't know anybody who's worked with him that comes away going, well, that was nice. You come away a different person. He, he, he infuses you, like when, when we were doing that movie, he gave us poetry, he gave us music. He played music during takes. They would just get you into this incredible spirit and very inspiring. I remember when the, the boys stood on their desk, I was going, this is very powerful. And I looked over and I saw a teamster crying and I went, okay, this is really working. But it was in a, you know, this inspirational movie where it's the first time I did a film where people were touched beyond the movie, where they want to change their lives. And I hope for the better to be, many people said so they became teachers and went, oh, good luck. Especially picking that profession in America where you know that's going to be really, you have to be dedicated to be that. Done with Peter Weir, who was an amazing director. Did you tone yourself down a bit for that? He was yeah, not he as off the wall as you. Yeah, often. but he said basically that, you know, there's no need. Man lives, just let his ideas speak for that and just and commit to the ideas. He was the one that said, just because you say action, you don't necessarily have to act, you know, which is great. It's a very freeing thing to say, just be in it. And that's great. It was wonderful. In The Fisher King, Robin plays a man who becomes catatonic after witnessing his wife's death. It's a difficult film to break down due to the many complex layers it possesses. Even Robin has a hard time explaining the meaning of the film, although his words will do much more justice than mine. It's about a lot of things, but it's a little difficult to grasp in like two seconds. I don't think you can tell him about one thing. I think that's what it doesn't come and say, it's about trust. <laughs> It's about compassion, it's about pain, it's, and then you start getting this list of... If in anything, the core of it is about... It is about compassion. And it's a, in that sense, it uses a, a, that Christian myth of the Fisher King, which is about the nature of compassion and what is it. And it is not out looking all over the place when it's, you know, it is right there in front of you. And dealing with the simplest pains. To see someone, it's like the last line of the thing, I, I didn't see a king, I only saw a man who was thirsty that it's that simple and it kind of has to be a fool who does it and it seems it's it almost sounds buddhist in the way it is you know it's like something that's so simple but yet so lost in most people it isn't people say is this movie about homelessness no it's about damaged people you know who he, he has in essence a home he lives in a basement of a building but it's about dealing with people more than just on the level of you know if i give enough money they'll go away that doesn't deal trying to get their life together um you know, about four people trying to get their lives together and, and through connection with other people. And in the end, that's all you have, you know. There's this incredible loneliness that you can experience to the point where he creates a whole other person to deal with, to come out of, to find, you know, to find redemption, to find himself again from a hu horribly traumatic event that happens every other day in America. It's just about impossible to talk about Robin Williams without mentioning his comedies. There's many teachings to pull from his serious roles, but even his comedies offer a substantial amount of wisdom. Here Robin relates the 1992 film Toys to concerns he has for the younger generation. Kids have too many toys in this country. In the West indeed, the kids have too many toys. It may be true. It also, I think they have toys that don't allow them to use their imagination. So many toys have forgotten how to play. Yeah, because when you have that many things, you're just kind of inundated. You can see that sometimes where they go, <laughs> where do I begin? You know, and they also have toys that do everything for them so they don't have to create it. I mean, they have interactive toys. They have the ones that good morning. How are you? T I'm always frightened that those interactive ones, you're going to wake up one day and I have a little knife going, I don't like daddy. These are the things you have to, you have to remember that. Even, in, and even video games, you know. I play them with my son, but it seems like everything is done for you. You don't have to imagine it. There's also a dangerous thing because it, you tend to just be focused on the game and you won't relate to each other. You just be like this. In the cartoon Fern Gully, he raises awareness for the Australian rainforest. He also relates to American forests in this interview. When I did that cartoon Fern Gully, which was trying to just make a point, just to try and you know teach a little awareness on that level. I've this done, was an Australian setting. Yeah, yeah, it was on the Australian rainforest. 
which you're losing at a rapid rate, and so are we. Everyone, is, they're, they're cutting them down. In America, I mean, everyone talks about the Amazonian rainforest, but America has lost more of their old growth, incredible woods than any place. And they're all gone. And it's usually just to sell to Japanese for, you know, for paneling. Do people want to hear Robin Williams tell them that? Don't we want a comedian to divert us from problems yeah, we can do nothing if you, about? Yeah, you could, and it'd be quite nice, and then eventually we'll all be doing comedy, and I'll be going... <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you, your oxygen filter backs up? I mean, there's, you can divert or you can make people aware of it, and you, that's what comedy can do without, you know, stuffing it down your throat, you know? Many people consider Robin Williams one of the greatest comics and actors of all time. But where is it he gets the inspiration from? I think that sometimes when I perform, that it's just you open yourself up and things pass through you like a good vowel movement. You, you let it go and you find ideas that way. I don't know where they come from and I don't bother asking. For a man that sheds so much light, it's hard to see where the dark side of Robin Williams comes from. A Robin Williams quote that sticks out to me is, all it takes is a beautiful fake smile to hide an injured soul and they will never notice how broken you really are. It makes me wonder how much time he spent hiding behind his own fake smile. Yeah, it, at times like that you, you understand that um... That Marceau piece where, that he does that's so frightening, where the man is caught in the comic mask. Yeah, I used to do a thing about that too, about called Celebrity, about this man standing on the guy, so the big smile goes home and I take something like... <laughs> <laughs> and it's a monster, but... Yeah, it's like really... a whole bizarre thing, because sometimes you, maintaining that yeah. is a very scary thing. And, and not being able to get out of it. Um... Yeah, it's true. You said about sometimes being on, that people, mm -hmm. people want you to be a certain way. And sometimes you can't help but be depressed, or, you know, just the yeah. nature of being... How, how do you work through that? Um, all performances, performers do experience kind of depression. And uh, um, I once saw a show of Steve Martin's that I thought was quite good. And he said I wasn't really feeling funny that night, but I worked my way through it. We have autopilot. I mean, there's a, yeah. something in your way. There'll be certain things that you know you can do that will work. But for me, I love to take the chances and improvise. That's when I'm really, that's the greatest tie in the world when you're trying new stuff yeah. and or getting suggestions and playing and doing new things. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. That's the unknown, the special yeah. land. Robin was quite open about his problems with substance abuse over the years. But how did his addictions begin? And where does someone find the courage to step away from these habits? But do you remember getting into it? You getting into it? No. Was I remember it a gradual that, thing? Or? It was very gradual. It was just, <laughs> and you're off, you know, oh, yes. you're off and running. Of course, there are people who would say, why did you ever need cocaine? You, you're, yeah, it's a bit redundant. You're, you're, as, you're as fast without it as, as, totally. the, as the heaviest cocaine addict would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, it's that weird thing. But I think I did it because it would, it would actually allow me not to talk. It was like, you know, reverse medication. You know, why they give Ritalin to hyperactive children is that idea of kind of, oh, okay, I don't have to talk to people. It kind of shuts you down. Mm. Which is, uh, you know. How hard was it to break the grip the second time around? Um, not hard once you go to rehab. I mean, really? rehab is, yeah, that's the beginning of kind of, you know, um, the idea is you got to surrender. You got to just say, I can't do it. Because, you know, <laughs> I, w I went to rehab with a lot of doctors and psychiatrists. I mean, and the, the more intelligent you think you are, the harder it is to let go. You think, I've got a solution. I'll just drink a little bit. Of it. And then you have to go, nope, you lose. You can't do it. You need help. And at that point, that's the beginning. The best known Robin Williams quote, I think, is that cocaine is God's way of showing you that you're earning too much money. Yeah, because I knew people that just literally, you know, snorted their income, you know, the, the Columbian College Fund. <laughs> the truth is, a lot of times, you don't have to pay for it if you're famous, because people want to give it to you, because they, they somehow gives them control over you, because once you're really into it, you'll do anything. You'll talk to people that you normally wouldn't talk to in daylight, but you'll hang out with them till four o'clock in the morning. And that's, that's what's ludicrous. Why did you do it so much? Then? I don't know, because people said, do you have a drug problem? I say, no, everybody has it. <laughs> you know, everyone offers it to you at a certain point. It's just developing that skill, which is what they try and teach children to say, no, there's no need. Why? If you don't enjoy it, why do you keep doing it? Because it's everywhere. And part of me figured out later that it was just this desire. It was a great way to kind of avoid contact with people. As much as it was like partially meeting them, but it was also you pulling back. It's so nice now to have conversations with people. How did you get off it? Just realized this is ridiculous. I was about to have a child and I didn't want to be going, hey, at four o'clock in the morning, want to play with dad? I wanted to be able to not miss that. With, with drinking, you're, you're jumping over the edge. Uh, there was a guy who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and he survived. And they said, uh, do you have anything to say? He said, yes, halfway down, I thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> and uh, I had 20 years sober and then all of a sudden I thought, I could drink again. No, no, you can't. 
There's a line in Garp that you say you can look at the arc of your life and find it interesting. That's, I mean, that's what it's been for me. It's nice that it has been getting better and better. That's the only thing I pull, have, uh, pull out of it. I mean, that's nice that it keeps trying. And I, the fact that I'm offered these amazing things to keep, to keep doing stuff that keeps exploring different aspects, that's wonderful too. The first movie was Popeye. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you remember, the opening scene is Robin in a rowboat in a storm. And I was just, here's this huge screen at Chinese theater in uh, Los Angeles. And I thought, that's Robin, my little boy Robin. Look at him. Eat your heart out, world. Here he comes. <laughs> Performing and doing all these things, we never acknowledge anything negative. Where it's, and if you do, it gets very violent. Like the time, mm -hmm. what happens immediately after the scene you just saw is, he starts to confront who you are. So mm -hmm. you, I know who you are, and he get, he would have really hurt Jeff's character if he'd gone any further. Yeah. And that's why he goes. The hallucination guards against that. It's basically it is freeing to create that character because yeah, you can I really so. explore, kind of where you've been and the aspects of why you would want to deny and that kind of whole mm -hmm. aspect of you know performing for the sake of just avoiding. For him, love is such a delicate thing that if, and even getting it back again, triggers another one of the breakdowns. Uh -huh. It's so fragile for him. And that's what makes it interesting. That's why I did it. There's a sadness and then you have to go, there's also hope. I mean, a sadness, it's always like, yeah, you wish they hadn't happened, but they did. And the purpose is to make you different. It's what they call a Buddhist gift. I would call it the ultimate Christian gift. It's that idea of, you're back and you realize the thing that matters are others. Way beyond yourself. Self goes away. Ego, bye-bye. You're not easy on yourself in this show, are you? No. You know, as an alcoholic, I talk about, you know, some warning signs, you know, like DUIs in a cul-de-sac, things like that. The idea of, you know, have you been through it to talk about it and see, like, you know, this is what you go through, heart surgery, you know, alcoholism. I went to rehab in wine country just to keep my options open. You know, these are things you got to talk about. You want to talk about it? No. Why is there such a heavy, heavy-duty problem with drugs? That addresses the psychology of a nation. That's why I talk about it. You try and tell people you do it. Just say no. No, just say Noriega. No, beyond that. It is something much, much deeper. And yes, you're right. There is something wrong. But people are slowly waking up. The time is over for just sitting going, it'll be taken care of. And I try to address it in, using the only weapon I have, comedy. And that's all we do. And I hope people wake up, and they are. We ask for your help, and we'll try and help from this end, and we'll meet, and there will be a kinder, gentler nation one day. Thank you. And we all have a great need for acceptance. But you must trust that your beliefs are unique, your own, even though others may think them odd or unpopular, even though the herd may go, that's bad. <laughs> I don't envision myself as a teacher or as a, I can't proselytize to people even when we talk about drugs or anything. I just, you just have to, I, I'm a player and in mm -hmm. the sense of just in the process of playing, you can talk about some interesting things, mm -hmm. you know, it, that there's things that, you know, why we've evolved to, you know, to make that connection, to go on, to, to do amazing things, to, and, and that moment, I talked about this once, that there is a, the thing when you create, when you find that little tiny flash, when you find some it's like idea. Bliss. It's what it's bliss. Well, because the brain gives you the same reinforcement that right. it does with sex. <laughs> That's right. And the reason the brain gives you a little hit of endorphin when you create is just to keep you going. Here's a taste. Yes. Keep creating, you get another taste. Because uh -huh. you're only given a little spark of madness. And if you lose that, you're nothing. Basically, when you're really firing and it really works, it's like musicians have said it, or writers say it, it's just, you're just channeling. It's truly that, that's why you say that divine inspiration, where it just passes, you're just letting it through you. I just wanted to ask Robin real quick about what's his favorite type of movie in terms of ones that make social impacts or ones that are fun, loving, like Aladdin, for example. They both, I mean, I, I love doing both of them because I think in their own way, they both have some effect. I remember people coming up after Aladdin and saying, you know, it was such a great thing that they could sit with their kid and laugh mm -hmm. as much as their child. That I think is a great thing. It's like, you know, Sullivan's Travels where you see people just having a wonderful time, especially in times like this. Mm -hmm. Why well, also, why you do a movie is to learn, to expand yourself, to push yourself. It was like Peter Weir when I did Dead Poet Society. He, he said the power of silence, that he said, you don't have to do anything and make a point. And, or the, the power of thought. But, you know, you learn something and you make a movie, which is a double bill.
Yeah, and you get paid. It's, but it's, I mean, that, if the truth is, if they knew it, I'd probably do it for much less. <laughs> I don't know how much value I have in this universe, but I do know that I made a few people happier than they would have been without me. And as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever need to be. I mean, you know, there's some movies you do for money, and those are the dangerous ones. Mm. Old dogs, we'll talk later. <laughs> but the idea that you do those and you go, and you know why you're making them. It's a kid's comedy, you know it's going to be silly, and you know that's going to be up for grabs. But with something like World's Greatest Dad, it's like, no, you do it as a labor of love and you do it with friends who you feel like you can do it with and say, hey, we're both in this together. And that's kind of wonderful. They're all done with this kind of love. You know, you, 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 you commit to it and you go, whatever happens, I'm in. I'm proud of it. You know? That's always what I want to do yeah. is to try different things and kind of always change perceptions. And, and change the rhythm. You can. Yeah, break up. It's, it is a rhythm. It's basically saying, OK, now we hit it, you know, that and then, you know, hit a little harder and then back off and then go berserk like, you know, with the, the stand-up, which is just free form, and then come back and play something so controlled like a one-hour photo, those are all possible. And having that, that range really helps. For me, it's great. And but having great friends and family that yeah. just make life extraordinary. And a world to still go out and see and learn about, which is yeah. most important of all. Just look at your own life and just realize what, what things are precious to you. That's what I did when I was doing it. You know, I would come home and just realize how extraordinary that there is, you have heaven in front of you. That idea that you have, look around and see the precious things, the connection with family, friends, you know, the, the, the things in your, and the people, especially in your life. My kids are extraordinary. Did they go through rough times? Yeah, but you come out the other side and I go, God, they're so amazing. I'm just, I'm so blessed. I would hope that there would be, if there was an afterlife, that would have the places that I, or at least a version of the places I've grown that I think are extraordinary here. Mountains, lakes, forests, beaches with perfect curl. Um, but also, I mean, a place almost like Venice. Where, I mean, there's times in Venice to me, I've been there when I just go, my God, what a glorious city. And, and even New York in spring where you can go, there's times in every different place that you've been where you say, this is, this is paradise, or this is extraordinary. I would hope that there'd be something like that. And most of all, I would hope you'd come in contact with extraordinary people, like the ones I've met in life. The powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? think your legacy will be? God knows. I don't know. They had a thing recently where they showed a clip of all the HBO specials I did and it was like going, I'm still alive. Why are they doing this? I don't know what my legacy is. Is that it? I mean, that I had a good time and I think also that I've tried different things throughout my career and I hope to keep doing that and to keep working with interesting people. Make your life spectacular. I know I did. Just keep going, find that thing you love because it's tough work. Uh, and my father gave me this advice when I said I wanted to be an actor, he said have a backup profession like welding. But I think if you can find that thing that really gives you joy, that'll be it. Because uh, for me it's always been comedy and stand-up and, and acting too because of exploring behavior. But it's tough work, but it's, and if you can get it, even better. Realize there are a lot, a lot of amazing people out there to be grateful for. And a loving God. And that, other than that, Good luck. That's what life is about. Most Earthlings try very hard to be recognized for what they do, but when they become stars, sir, they realize they're recognized wherever they go. You have responsibilities, anxieties, and, well, to be honest, sir, some of them can't take it. Was instant stardom like that, and instant fame like that, disorienting? Very. It's like being taken from the bottom of Death Valley to the top of the Empire State Building in two seconds. It's totally disorienting. To be from, you know, just performing in the comedy store, small clubs, and all of a sudden have everybody know you. And that happened. And that was instantaneous. And that, it's a little frightening, too. I mean, you know, people, if you're kind of shy, and sometimes I get kind of like this, that, they, you know, people would, they just look at you. Cocaine, hmm, what a wonderful drug. Anything that makes you paranoid and impotent, give me more of that. <laughs> One of the great triumphs of your life was the way you beat drugs. But do you think that getting into them was the effect of success or just the atmosphere of the 70s and 80s? I mean, success was one. It was like, it's like the old joke. Do you have a drug problem? No, everybody had it. It, wasn't, it was a great way of kind of avoiding contact. And then you get into this kind of, you want to pull back from it. 
rather than experience it because it's frightening and you're trying to find some way to pull away. I think it was just, it was escaping from people, basically. It was, you know, just, you know, the, the, from those people going, hey. When you're a celebrity, everybody wants a piece of you, sir. Unless you can say no, there will be no pieces left for yourself. Sometimes it was the fear of failure. It was that thing of, you know, if you didn't notice, you wouldn't, because it was coming so fast, it was that fear of when's it gonna go? Rather than just keep, you know, finding and doing different things. Cocaine actually made me almost not sleepy, but it would just shut me down. I would get like this. And I think that's why I did it. So I wouldn't have to experience. So it was cutting off from people, as yeah, you said. Yeah, it was isolating. It was, and then years later after I stopped, when I see people, they're actually going, you just made eye contact, how you doing? <laughs> Because most of the time you didn't have to. It was a great chance not to look at people. It was, you know, this. I couldn't see anyone. It's because, once again, it's the brain. The brain, once it tastes it, will want to go back up to the same level. We'll demand that because it's psychologically addicting. They found that out. And how long, how long did it take you to feel that sense of liberation that you mentioned Richard Pryor felt? It took you about a year. Someone said you, you're liberated when you don't talk about it. When you don't mention, oh, uh, you don't have to say anything when it doesn't appear in your subconscious, when it's just gone. Something very freeing about having, having your mind back and in your control. The ideas that you find will get you the same kind of stimulus. And then what other things happen is you start to relate to people again. And as you come back into the world and relate to them, they're stimulating and realizing that can be quite wonderful. Conversations with friends, you know, playing, playing with your child. You know, all of these things can be just as stimulating and wonderfully so and nourishing. And then all of a sudden you start to come back. It's a, it's a, you know, it's just a process of that, of, you know, building that in again. You treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win no matter what the outcome. We're providing a security of acknowledging who I am and saying, I love that. I love what you are. Don't be afraid. And it's like, oh. Then that frees you up. You really do? Me? I used to talk about myself. I used to have this image that I was kind of like this, almost like a dwarf, because I'd been called that in school. I was like this little short, short, furry, furry guy. And then I said, so I love that. Really? But that's, that's been the process, and it's so wonderful. And it's growing. And you learn, and you go through, and it's been tough. And the way that all of Oliver's work is, he makes you examine these supposedly negative and horrifying things from another perspective and say, yes, these are, you know, there is great pain in aspects to that, but he also says, look at the power of the human spirit, and more than just the spirit, the power of the mind, and distinguishing between the mind and the brain. Some people say that the brain is a computer, but he said, no, beyond that, there is something, there is deity within you, there is that, you know, that spark, that divine thing, and it stems from creation, that, that thing that is soul. The human spirit is more powerful than any drug. And that is what needs to be nourished. And that's what I was fascinated by with Oliver's writing and with Awakenings. That which can shine through something that which seems apparently dead, but yet the, the human mind and spirit shines through that. And you saw it in the tapes when he showed me the tapes of some of the patients. And they would be like this, and he'd say, watch. And all of a sudden, they would come back. And you can see they were there, and then they would go out again. And it would be in that moment you knew. And he said that was, he was only going on that faith that they were there. Well, I was going to say, did meeting those people over such a sustained period of time, concentrated period of time, I mean, did it make you feel that life is incredibly unfair? Or did you feel that maybe it's fair because they have some compensating thing that we don't? The thing that makes me sometimes feel that life is unfair, that flattens me, is when you see children with cancer. When they bring that, I say, why? I mean. We had a young boy come to the set of Hook who wrote and came and he said, why? why, why do this? I mean, why is it that they have this? I mean, that sometimes, one time I go, oh, if it's benevolent and all this, why are they? But yet, then after a while you talk to them and even then you, they have such a, a will and a power that any time you start to think, oh, my life, and go, look at this child. The, this one little boy was eight, shaved head from chemotherapy, but had such a strength and a power and such a joy that he was just like, it was beyond intoxicating that he basically had this will and this spirit and this love and was not bitter and was not angry. He was still a child and he still would take me to meet the other kids and say, 
Look, and this is my friend, that's Tommy. He's not a machine, but he's okay, you know, and he's fine. He likes Legos. And he, he wasn't like this, you know, and obviously there were times when it's horrible, horrible, horribly painful. Does religion matter to you much? Oh, deeply. I mean, it comes from years ago when I used to treat it more in kind of that cosmic sense, like Einstein said, if you, when you look around and you see all, all of it, you have to realize there's some, you know, method behind it all. And, there's, and, and the, truly your sense of awe and your sense of wonder and then you begin to approach that. And then from the painful issues, you know, when you, what we've just talked about. Can you be angry at that? Or do you kind of start to go beyond and look at it all and realize not to be bitter, not to be angry, but to still treat, keep trying and not give up on people? Don't give up on me. I'm not. What infuriates me sometimes here is that the lack of, sometimes just the sheer lack of funding. When the truth is we're broke, so you can't even get furious about that. But how can you deny when there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have AIDS and are dying of it and just turn your head on them? And not them people are dying alone in their rooms. And why do you, why do, you do that? Well, Jesse sometimes will deny the funds because this is God's will. Well, Jesse sometimes wake up, you know? So you have to take that stand and, you know, wander among people that's and not be afraid of that and to wander among into the world and to put your heart and soul behind trying to still keep things going not to accept it and just say well it's the way it is and to trying to help these children if it, if you can't cure it and to make their life wonderful now and to let you know to try and do these things that, you know that allows them to have a wonderful life despite this with work play friendship family. These are the things that matter. Not just for your, your own family, but for the family of man. That there are, we are, we are one species. And we are endangered. We are about, you know, we are basically destroying ourselves from within unless you wise up and start to take certain measures on all levels, on all levels. And that's where you have and it's what this one, this three and a half pound gland that we have, the one cure lies within the same thing that is causing a lot of the pain is this. Well, why, why if we've got those brains, why are we destroying ourselves with because food? Why are we, why are we so self-destructive? Because Kessler used to say we haven't evolved, <laughs> we haven't, you know, jumped between the, the lower brains, the, you know, the lizard and the mammal, you know. There are very few mammals that, you know, kill each other off except for rats. <laughs> and then sometimes you wonder why we look like that. That we have to evolve up, somehow take the leap to evolve the, the emotional level with this intellect that can create amazing machines that can save life, but also create amazing machines that can take it and in two seconds, destroy the world. And to evolve and to join, to somehow catch up to all of the different things. He was suggesting that they should make a drug that, that somehow bridges the gap emotionally between this, you know, you have these, you know, powerful soul and these feelings, but sometimes could be overridden by this mind that can say, we must extinguish all the others. And then you go, wait, this was an intellect that came up with that concept. And wait, bring the heart up to that, to override that, and to join all of them. These are the things that is it's happening. We, will we catch up to ourselves? Will we somehow be in control of that we still have these primitive urges that used to make me take you know it's when we were like running around going Ugh! Ugh! but now we have a big stick that basically burns everything Ugh! 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 gone you know these are the things that you have to you know you try you play with you it was a comic you play with it but you're still playing with pain no matter what anybody tells you Words and ideas can change the world. Do you have a favorite role ac across the years? Yeah, Dead Poets Society. Yeah. With one of the great directors, Peter Weir, who is an Australian and an amazing, he's a director, but he's also a teacher. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's ever worked with him comes out a better person. He gave me the greatest advice of all. He said, you know, you don't have to say anything. Yeah. If you listen, like I'm doing right now. Okay, back. <laughs> But he said, if you really listen with intent, you're, you can be quite powerful. And it was it took so much pressure off of thinking, I've got to be ready to say the next thing. And it was just this idea of inhabiting that just as much as speaking. It, just, it was a great gift. Well, when you're approaching 60, you, you look happy, you look comfortable, you look... Yeah, quiet. It's just a quiet life. Yeah, I'm as peaceful as I can be as a 
59 year old comic. It's kind of like the old joke where you just, you don't have to, don't rush down the hill, walk down. You know, you have a good time. Life's pretty amazing, especially after rehab and heart surgery, it's really amazing. The powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be?